Okay, so we have reached uh, the final talk for the day. No pressure, Chris. Uh, fireworks, 3D illustrations, complex algorithms, you name it. Um, this is Chris from Cambridge, and uh, I also think this will be a very interesting talk. So, again, no pressure, and good luck, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Um, and actually, thank like all of you. It's been really great for the last couple of days and um, hanging out with you guys and hearing some really interesting stuff. So, as you just heard, I'm Chris. I'm working with Sunis and actually another four people, so six of us, on the Pico project. Um, yeah, so like we said, we, we want to try and replace parcels. We want to try and make something that's actually better. Um, and so, to do that, we kind of break all compatibility. Kind of like clean slate, what if we could do this? What if we could just start again? Um, how would we get people to authenticate? And so our current thing is, dedicated device, that's really off putting. <laughs> dedicated device, um, capable of replacing as many types of passwords as we can, um, and eventually release it as an open standard with a really decent reference implementation that anyone can build, both on a server side and an actual device. So rather than having to remember terms of passwords, Pico remembers your secrets for you. Um, I'm not actually going to be talking that much about PK, so if you're keen to know, you feel free to ask me about it, or um, just go and Google one of Frank's previous talks or his paper, um, which I think expressed the kind of concept of the idea quite well. Um, so today, I'm actually going to tell you a little story, because um, I thought that would be a nice way to frame it, um, about a made-up person called Jess, and how, um, how some things that rely on visual codes for authentication are really quite broken. So. When, in this kind of scheme, when Jess wants to log in, she scans a visual code with a trusted device. Um, inside this visual code, um, it identifies the service, like her webmail in this example, um, and also the terminal that she wants to use for the session. Um, by doing this, what we can do is never reveal a long-term secret to the terminal, which in an environment where your terminal most definitely has malware on it, that seems like quite a good thing. <coughs> Um, she also only needs to unlock one device rather than having to remember a secret for every single service. Um, her device then goes away and by a separate channel mutually authenticates with the service. Um, and then instructs the service to allow the terminal, which was identified by the visual code, to log in as her. Ta-da. Um, there's a really big fundamental issue with this. And it's that basically that I can convince you, scan a visual code, which will log my terminal into your account. So I can convince you to scan a visual code which will log my terminal into your account. Well, how can I do this? Um, imagine a world where this kind of scheme might have caught on. So I could run or compromise a different service, let's say a blog of this conference or something. Um, and I simply just lift the visual code, put it in my page. Um, if Jess wants to log into my blog and to comment on something, she just scans the code and that logs me into her Google account. Because all I've done is taken the thing which is going to authorize my terminal and given it to her, and she scanned it blindly. So to sort of fix this, some people have suggested um, that Jess should check the URL of the website, and that matches the um, address of the verifier. So she gets a confirm screen like this one, which is um, from a paper um, from Stanford called snap to pass which is described as a scheme like this. Um, with a big colourful logo. And we all know this type of thing doesn't work. People are really susceptible to phishing. Um, most people will just be learned to click yes without really looking. Um, and even if the user is well trained, if we combine this with regular phishing, um, they're really quite, um, they're really in trouble because um, if they can't identify the, the website either. So all I do is address up a fake Google login page lift the proper visual code and put it in that. And at this point, she has to check the identity of the verifier on the terminal and the HTTPS is being used, and the identity of the visual code authenticator. So this type of system is not resilient to phishing at all. Actually, it's even harder for the user to defend themselves from phishing. And I mean, I could even say, email her a QR code saying, I'm from your bank to, to validate X or Y or Z. Scan this visual code. Um, and obviously you can defend that kind of thing by having, maybe having a time limit on them. But 
none of these things fundamentally change this issue. So let's step back for a second. And I've described a problem of systems that don't really exist yet. And we kind of thought that too, um, because we built a system designed to show the usability aspects of PK without doing any crypto or anything like this. And kind of spotted, oh yeah, that's a really stupid design decision. Um, then we spotted something called Squirrel, um, which is an attempt at an open source project, which does exactly the same thing. Um, and there's a sample of SAPS paths. Um, there's another research project um, in the Netherlands called Ticker. Um, and so, as well as also um, some freeware and commercial ventures into this area. Um, if you just Google QR code login, loads of people are making this mistake. So I was going to go into a little bit more detail. Um, but actually, I'm not criticizing necessarily the implementation of these systems, more their fundamental architecture, because um, the implementation is quite variable, they're researchy. But um, actually, I want to argue that the, the fundamental architecture of embedding a challenge in the QR code is just a completely flawed concept um, for the area of web authentication. So in my helpful, exciting diagram, um, we have a website offering a service, the web browser the user, and their visual code authenticated device, which could be a mobile phone, it could be their Pico, it could be um, some other dedicated hardware device. Um, doesn't really matter for this kind of purpose. So um, the user requests a login page from the website, and then the response um, includes the identity of the author, um, authentication service, so maybe a public key or something, or just a URL, um, and some sort of session logs, which is fresh. This information is displayed in the web browser. The user scans um, the QR code. And then this um, starts up an authentication session. So to make things clearer, I've kind of split off the website and shown you a separate authentication service. So some sort of authentication protocol uh, varies a lot in how they do it. But somehow in that, the, the virtual authenticator sends an authenticated user ID and the session logs to the authentication service. Um, this then internally instructs the website um, to allow the user to log in. Um, at this point, we've got this kind of square going on. Um, the web browser knows nothing about anything that's happened so far. Um, and in all of these schemes, what happens next is the website presents the session logs, which has sort of implicitly become a one-time password or a capability, depending on how you want to look at it, to log into that account. Um, and then we get a session cookie like we do in a normal session and everything continues as if the user had used a username and password, it's all the same. And we could try and automate this sending of a session logs by perhaps, perhaps having like a poll listening, uh, listening or something like that. But I don't think that really fundamentally changes the way the system works. So how do we attack this, right? So we have a pretty standard man in the middle coming up here. So the man in the middle requests the login page, um, relays it to the user, the user scans the code, um, then the, the visual code authenticator knows nothing about this relaying and just goes through the separate channel straight to the valid authentication service. Um, that instructs the website to allow the user to log in. The attacker then present, presents their credential and gets logged in. Um, is that kind of clear? Um, it's deliberately done as like really similar to the other diagram to make the point this isn't a particularly complicated attack to um, mount. So why do I think this is vaguely important? Um, because a man in the middle like this can break loads of current authentication schemes, um, depending on whether you have HTTPS with, um, sorry, HTTPS will be fixed things, but not everyone uses HTTPS, and we have a talk about um, uh, session hijacking and all that kind of thing. But the reason this is perhaps worse for this kind of system is that we've essentially made a device that can be fished. We've made a device that automates the process of the user being fished <laughs> for them. Um, so, Assuming people are not going to reliably check that their session is using HTTPS and that their identities all match and all that, um, what on earth can we do? So some people would suggest um, we display the visual code in a trusted environment, so like a browser plugin or something. But again, users are easily fooled. There was a phishing study, where was it? Um, why phishing works, um, where a good phishing site convinced 90% of the general public that it was a genuine site. So trusted visual code display, unlikely to actually work in practice. Um, another thing um, we could try is trying to bind the location of the two things. Um, some people have suggested that. Um, 
The problem is that it's basically impossible to check when we have an expected mismatch. So, for example, if I'm using the Wi-Fi here, but my phone is my visual credit authentication on a mobile network, there's going to be a location mismatch. I'm not going to be able to pin down the GRIP. And actually, stuff like GRIP is only um, has a 15% um, gets 15% locations wrong. Not even that it doesn't know 15% locations. It actually gets 15% locations wrong by 40 kilometers. So either we end up blocking loads of legitimate logins or allowing some, some bad ones through, which clearly isn't a proper solution. Um, so maybe in the realm of slightly better ways of fixing this. Um, we could use a secure bookmark on the authenticator. Um, and this has been suggested in several academic papers, such as one called foolproof phishing, um, which I recommend you read if you haven't. Um, which essentially means you select the account you want to log into on the device first. Um, and that fixes this issue, but at a price, we now have to have a, uh, quite a big UI on the device, which maybe if it's a smartphone doesn't really matter, but if it's a dedicated power token, will make it a lot more expensive or difficult or annoying to carry. And we also need a secure channel from the device back to the PC that we're hopefully reasonably confident is not being relayed. However, um, one of the design goals of Pico is to have um, distance bounding or some approximation of distance bounding between your Pico and the terminal. So actually, we already need this secure channel. So maybe that's less of an issue. Um, but if we actually use the visual code still, but we use it just as an index into the database of credentials, so we just use it as a service identifier rather than embedding a challenge, um, this problem kind of goes away. Um, so the user scans the code, which triggers this mutual authentication, exactly the same as before. Um, but instead now, the service can just hand, rather, rather than have the browser having this sort of one-time password capability, this is handed to the visual code authenticator, which then hands it over this hopefully unrelated channel to the terminal, so the terminal can be logged in. So you can see that this isn't, I haven't sort of spotted the, the easy answer to fixing this. We're fundamentally changing the architecture. Um, and obviously this is a complete pain because we'd need to modify the terminal to work with this, so we need extra, maybe even hardware and software on the terminal. We also need um, our visual code authenticator to work with that, and we need to somehow set that up. Um, so we thought, actually, as a fallback, there's no reason that such a device couldn't present the user with a one-time password. And actually, if we present it as a URL for them to type in the web browser um, address bar, they might even not be fished too easily, although perhaps some people will just Google the um, their capability. But, um, so we actually have sort of two parallel solutions um, that you can use, one of which sacrifices deployability, another one of which sacrifices usability for the sake of each other. Chris, have you lost your mic? Oh no, I'm really sorry. I, oh, I just screwed up the recording. Uh, probably okay. <laughs> you have a really loud, like, sort of last few minutes of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That was really stupid. Um, but yeah, actually, that's, that's what I really have to say. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Thanks for this. I mean, I didn't want to sort of go really, really deep into the detail because I don't think it's actually... It's the, fun of it, it's the architecture that's much more interesting than the ins and outs, because we have we've sort of gone through a fine tooth comb with all of these schemes, double checking that they are all actually vulnerable to this type of attack, um, even though they all are um, wildly. Oh, sorry. So there you go. There's my list of um, possible solutions, um, and we want to add this fallback mechanism. So we maintain the ability to authenticate if you just turn up and want to use a machine. So, any questions? And um, thanks for listening. Well, uh, as soon as they announced Squirrel, uh, I guess other people as well got a lot of questions about, do you think this is good? Hmm. And I read it, and initial thought is, yes, this is, they do solve a couple of problems that are this good. But it also took like 24, 48 hours before somebody put out a tweet saying that you can still do the uh, relaying and, and, and you know, man in the middle attack on, 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 on Squirrel as well. But um, the reason for why you are saying that it's, it's broken, it's not good enough, hmm. is that only because of, of that it can be uh, man in the middle attacked or 
it, it, or, 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 or some other arguments as well, like in, into usability and psychology for that kind um, of, that makes Skrill not a good solution? I think Skrill is probably not the best example because they've got some very bizarre uses of um, like crypto constructs and stuff like that at the lower level. Mm -hmm. um, there's <laughs> there's a wonderful thing actually. There's um, it has a, a revocation protocol that sort of abuses Diffie-Hellman in such a way that the website has a secret, which is the which holds a secret in plain text, which is your revocation key, mm -hmm. um, which you then regenerate on your device with um, something you kept offline. So if someone hacks the website and gets the password list, they can then request revocation on everyone's account. So there are there are lots and lots of problems with such schemes. There are problems with usability in such schemes as well. I mean, I don't wouldn't say I'm a massive expert, nor do a lot of them have decent implementations to actually try out. Um, one thing is how long does it take you to um, say it's on a phone? How long does it take you to pick up your phone, scan a QR code with the application, select an account, maybe if you've got a choice, um, and then for all of the back end stuff, I mean, that will only take a few seconds, but you might even be talking about 30 seconds worth of authentication, which is enough to completely interrupt whatever task you're actually trying to do. Mm. Um, and you have to unlock your phone first as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah. So, so one of the, the things that we, we want to not do in Pico is to try and, re to reduce, want to try and reduce that. One of the thoughts is um, if I walk away from my machine with Pico, the distance bounding will see break, and it will lock the machine. But if I come back within some certain configurable amount of time, there's no reason why I can't just unlock again. Um, and obviously, other people have done this kind of stuff before. And there are flaws like, oh, I walked past the wall of my office and my computer unlocked. Um, <laughs> but trying to actually reduce the number of times the user has to authenticate is probably quite useful. And also pushing authentications out from the task you're trying to do. If you, if you sort of start something and then have to authenticate halfway through, it's very disruptive to actually getting things done and very irritating. Whereas actually, if you have to do it between some sort of subtasks, it's actually more acceptable. Um, there's some research in that area as well. I'm sure Denise will actually give you better answers about this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> ask the question again. What's the, question? Um, what's the usability of these schemes like, basically? Well, um, using uh, having to scan a visual code versus having to type a password. I, I wasn't convinced until I actually used it, and then I was surprised that when you're actually pulling the device, you know, out of your pocket, or whatever, you don't think of that as taking time, but the actual taking the picture of the QR code takes almost no time. You're just surprised. I was just surprised at how quick it was when, when I did that. So um, I would say what's more important is the perception of time, not the actual amount of time. So when people are doing I think there's also a comment. Yeah, oh, sorry. Does, yeah. There's also a comment to make about um, the sort of cognitive load on the user. If, if it's oh, I need my password. Oh gosh, which one was it? Um, have I got to 13 or 14? <coughs> um, as we saw that a couple of talks ago. Um, whereas this at least doesn't require you to recall anything. Um, or then again, this um, the whole authentication is something you um, something you know, something you have, something you are, as well as something you you've forgotten something you've lost and <laughs> something you once were. Um, so something you've never been. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> we had an um, interesting discussion with someone saying that um, actually, I think it was 15% of their IT help desk time was taken up with password resets. Um, but about 7% was taken up with people who'd forgotten hardware tokens, like um, door entry cards and things. Mm -hmm. So there is a danger with this kind of thing of yeah, forgetting a password well, maybe that only affects one thing, but if you leave your hardware authenticator that authenticates you to everything at home or on a bus, 
Um, <laughs> Did you, that take into account the uh, benefits of other tokens versus afterwards? Yeah, that's true. Um, although I would say you have got quite a lot invested in a Pico if, you, if you've got authentication, um, if you've got pairings as such with loads and loads of different accounts. Yeah. Um, although you hope that it, at least it can't be stolen um, if you have the decent unlocking mechanism. or it, as it, well, it can be stolen, but at least at least they don't gain all your credentials. More questions, comments? Look up. So the advantage, the, the advantage of using, say, um, as a trusted device with secrets on it versus two-factor authentication. Because let's say you have a Google authentication on your mobile phone, so it's quite the same. Yeah, it's, it's not a dissimilar concept, although um, one of the goals of Pico is to see whether we can actually do this without you having to remember any secrets at all. Um, does it still work? Do we have, um, do we have reasonable assurance of security depending on how you want to define your threat model, um, that you can revoke it if it's lost or it does, it's not useful to someone to steal it. Or. So yeah, no, it's not hugely different. And, and also you can talk about um, how it compares to things like single sign-on schemes. One nice thing about this kind of concept is that the trusted third party is your device. It's not sitting out there on a server somewhere. Because the problem with the two-factor authentication is that if you're still saying, oh, I should probably use a different password everywhere, you still have all of these passwords to remember. You haven't solved that problem. But you're right. It, it does, there, are, there are interesting parallels to draw. I don't think it's like completely revolutionary design um, space, but it's kind of trying to push the boundaries of what a hardware token could be. OK. Well, thank you, Chris. <laughs>